This is a procedure ready .com talk about ectopic pregnancy. I'm going to go over the diagnosis of this condition and also what to do after. How do you manage it? So as usual, this is a um, disclaimer. This is just health information for education and um, thought provocation. It's not for managing patients or for treating yourself. So if you have any problems, make sure to um, take care of yourself and get in touch with um, a medical person. So for definitions, this is a pregnancy that occurs outside of the uterine cavity. And that essentially means the fallopian tube. So most commonly, ectopic pregnancy occurs in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. That's also the most common site of fertilization, the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Most common site of fertilization, also the most common site of ectopic pregnancy. And so you need to know that this can occur outside of the fallopian tube, for example, like on the ovary. Um, but the, the vast majority of cases are on the, are on the fallopian tube. And the major concern here is that you have this um, pregnancy because it is a pregnancy that's developing and growing but it's in the tube, and then it'll eventually cause a rupture, which can cause um, hemorrhage and death. The way this presents, there's two different situations where this is important. So one is as part of like an OBGYN or OB rotation. Then also just in general with any patient who comes in with abdominal pain, if it's a woman in the reproductive years, then ectopic pregnancy needs um, to be on the differential, especially given how um, severe this and life-threatening this, this thing can be. The way if there are, if there are symptoms, it'll present with abdominal pain um, or bleeding. And then sometimes they'll have no symptoms. It'll just be asymptomatic, but it'll present with a rupture with um, shock. So the risk factors, the, the way to think about this is the, well, with what is, with, is what's going on, right? So you have ovulation and you have fertilization occurring in the fallopian tube, and then, it, and then it's getting stuck. It's not going into the uterus. It's not implanting in the endometrium um, where it should. So something's causing it to get stuck in the fallopian tube. So this blastocyst is implanting and growing the fallopian tube. Why? It could be scarring, fibrosis, dysfunction of the, the fallopian tube, problems with motility. And so the risk factors are things that are related to that. For example, pelvic inflammatory disease can cause scarring, fibrosis of the fallopian tube. Assisted reproductive technology. The thing about that one is, um, so let's say someone needs assisted reproductive technology for some reason. And they also have an increased risk of um, Topic pregnancy. Maybe there's a primary problem with fallopian tube that's driving both of those things. Now that's just a way to think about it. It's not a, you know necessarily true all the time, but you can think about it that way. Is a fallopian tube problem more likely that they're going to have um, ectopic pregnancy? Yes, that is more likely. Is it more likely that they might need um, help with an assisted reproductive technology? Yeah, I think that makes sense too. Now with an IUD, and the important thing to note about IUDs are that we're talking about if a pregnancy occurs while someone has an IUD, the chance of an ectopic is greatly increased, like 20, 25 percent. Um, that's if the pregnancy occurs while they while they have um, the IUD, not just all comers in the population. And then with anything that you're getting asked about risk factors, always start off with, hey, a prior a prior one of these, right? Prior topic is um, a very important risk factor as well. So the basics to understand what's going on is one beta HGD production. So you have ovulation, you have fertilization, and you have that blastocyst surrounded by trophoblast cells that's going to differentiate into the to the early primitive placenta. So that's what's making beta HCG in a normal in a normal pregnancy and also in an ectopic pregnancy. And so in a normal pregnancy you'll have that implantation occurring in the in the uterus and endometrium, and then you'll have beta HCG doubling about every forty eight hours to a maximum um, of a hundred thousand at ten weeks. And it doesn't strictly double every forty eight hours throughout that whole time, but this this is a general framework and how to think about it. All right, so that's one thing to remember. And then the second one is how do you diagnose pregnancy? So one is beta HEG being positive, and in our case for ectopic pregnancy, we know we're starting out with a positive beta HEG. That's you know kind of what makes this whole discussion um, relevant. You're not concerned about ectopic if you don't have a positive beta HEG. But in terms of diagnosing pregnancy, you need to become more specific, as we saw um, you know, in one of the earlier lectures. Is you want to say, okay, not just are you pregnant or not, but is it an intrauterine pregnancy? And the way to figure that out is with transvaginal ultrasound. And the earliest time you can do that is with a beta HEG of about. 1500 at about week five. That's when you can say, that's when you can see the earliest you can see an intrauterine um, pregnancy. And then the next week, beta HGs um, increase up to about 5,000. You can start to see the fetal heart move. And then in the office, just general office setting, the earliest you can um, see things with the t regular Doppler um, is about 10 weeks when the beta HG is at its max. So keeping those things in mind, we'll move into how, to, how do you work this up and how do you sort of go through the flow chart. All right, so somebody comes in um, to the emergency room, they have some abdominal pain, they have a positive beta HCG, what do you do? So the first thing is you need to make sure it's a quantitative base, beta HCG. So you have um, a number, right? And so and if they're above or below 1,500, that decides if they're above the discriminatory zone or below. Remember, just like before, we saw how you need to be at 1,500 if you're going to see 
um, an irregular intrauterine pregnancy developing normally on transvaginal ultrasound. You have to be above this. Right? So that's why it's called the discriminatory zone. So if you're below the 1500, then you're below the discriminatory zone. You still get the ultrasound because you could find an ectopic pregnancy. And if you do find one, then you've made your diagnosis. Good, you've, made an, you've diagnosed an ectopic pregnancy. But let's say you don't see an ectopic pregnancy. You wouldn't expect to see an intrauterine pregnancy, and you have a beta HCG below 1500. All right, so now you're in the situation of um, an ectopic rule out. And this is just like other types of rule outs, um, you know, heart attack rule out or a you know, baby gets born. And they say their blood glucose is low, their temperature is a little bit low. They have to stay in the special care nursery for 48 hours, right, to see if they have sepsis, sepsis rule out. So it's the, kind of the same idea here, and that's, that's the way I would think about it. So in, in um, Q48 or 72 hours, two or three days, you need to repeat your testing, get another ultrasound, another HCG. And the question you're asking here is, is this HCG doubling? Remember, that would be normal, right? HCG is doubling. It went from uh, 200 up to 400. Okay, good. So it doubled. What does that mean? Well, that means that this could just be a normal developing pregnancy. You're not sure. So what you have to do is continue to follow this beta HCG until you get to 1,500 above the discriminatory zone, and that puts you over in this part of the flow chart. Okay, and if it's not doubling, then what's that telling you? That's telling you that there's something abnormal going on here. Maybe it's an ectopic pregnancy, maybe it's um, um, spontaneous abortion, but you could um, treat at that point then. If you have beta HCG that's not doubling, um, you could treat. All right, so now we'll go to the next side. We're, we're above the discriminatory zone. So that could either occur through this rule out process. Someone's, um, you're following up these serial HEGs to see if this is a normally developing uter uterine pregnancy or, or not. Um, then you get to this ultrasound uh, point, or the person could come in with an HEG above this. Okay, so the first question you ask when you're above the discriminatory zone is, can you see an intrauterine pregnancy? If you can see an intrauterine pregnancy, that's great. That's the normal situation, unless you have um, something very strange and rare going on. For example, two pregnancies at once, twins, right, with one ectopic and one intrauterine. Um, that's very rare and kind of beyond you know, my knowledge base um, to talk about that. So for the vast majority of cases, if you have the intrauterine pregnancy and you see it, you're above the discriminatory zone, then you're probably um, not having an ectopic pregnancy going on. But if you don't see the intrauterine pregnancy, the next question you ask is, um, can we find any adnexal mass? And if you can find an adnexal mass, then it's very likely that you have an ectopic pregnancy, right? So you have above the discriminatory zone, no intrauterine pregnancy, yes, adnexal mass, then that's a diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. But let's say you don't have an ad adnexal mass. Okay, so now you have no intrauterine pregnancy, no adnexal mass. So what do you do? And you know, with that, like with all this stuff in, in, in medicine, it's not a hundred, nothing's a hundred percent. So you don't want to just assume right away that it's an ectopic pregnancy. That there's iterator, um, you know, skill and variability at using the ultrasound machine and things like that. So what you want to do is you want to repeat the ultrasound and the beta HCG in two days, and then decide. So if maybe the intrauterine pregnancy will show up, and you'll say, okay, this was. Um, intrauterine pregnancy. Or maybe um, it won't, and the beta HCG won't be um, increasing as it should, won't be doubling. Then you could say, okay, this is abnormal. Um, we have an ectopic pregnancy here, and then you could treat as well. All right, so that's the general um, flow chart and how to think about diagnosing an ectopic pregnancy. So for now we move on to treatment. So the mainstay of treatment is uh, medical therapy. And so this there's assumptions that go into using medical therapy, and that's that you have a that you're, the person stable, it's not complicated, and it's early and small, which means that the HCG is less than 5,000. Um, you have to measure the size of the ectopic, be less than 4 centimeters, and you're not hearing um, the fetal heart. All right, and the treatment you use is uh, methotrexate, that's an antifolate, anti-metabolite um, type, type drug that kills the rapidly dividing, dividing cells. And you can't just treat somebody and then be done with it. You need to follow this beta HCG to make sure that the treatment worked. You should see levels of beta HCG declining a week after you start treatment. Okay, so it's important to select patients who you know you're going to be able to follow up with and see again because if the treatment didn't work, they're going to be walking around with an ectopic pregnancy that's still, you know, growing and increasing in size and could rupture, um, and they might think that they're fine because they went to the, to the doctor and got some treatment. So that, so that could be one reason that would push you towards um, surgical management as a more definitive therapy earlier on in addition to what I've listed here as surgical management. So surgery is needed um, frequently for, for these patients, and the reason that you need surgery is you have a, a ruptured ectopic mass, um, you have hemodynamic instability, you have failed medical therapy, 
or also maybe even if you have a patient who you're very, very concerned will be walking around with um, an untreated ectopic if they're not definitively um, treated at that visit. All right, and so if you do need to do surgery, uh, the way that's done is generally laparoscopic procedure as opposed to laparotomy, and you can do salpingectomy or salpingostomy. And going over these root words, uh, scopic, it's like a viewing instrument device, right? So you're looking through the ports, doing the procedure lap laparoscopically um, with a pneumoperitoneum. Or you can also do um, laparotomy if you're maybe in a super emergency situation. You have to do things very quickly. That's just otomy means cut or incision. Then you have ectomy, salpingectomy. You're removing the fallopian tube. And then ostomy, salpingostomy. You're not uh, removing the whole fallopian tube, but you're making a hole in it and removing the um, pelvic pregnancy. And that's what ostomy means, creating a hole. So now, um, by way of review, so what's the most common site for ectopic pregnancy? It's the ampulla of the fallopian tube. It's also the most common site of fertilization. How about risk factors? So in general, easy to remember because you just think about problems um, in the fallopian tube. You have PID, right? You have assistive reproductive technology. You have IUDs. Um, fallopian tube issues generally will increase the risk of having ectopic pregnancy. So the workup starts out right off the bat with beta HCG. What's the amount? Is it above or below the discriminatory zone? That'll tell you which way to go. You always will follow the beta HCG up with an ultrasound. We look both for intrauterine pregnancy and also um, for adnexal masses. If you're below the discriminatory zone and you're not seeing anything on ultrasound, then you have to be in this ectopic rule-out situation where you keep following up um, with HEG and ultrasounds until you get above the discriminatory zone, and then you can see um, is the pregnancy intrauterine or not. In the case of beta HGs that are doubling, right, suggesting that there could be a normal intrauterine pregnancy that's just very early on. All right, and if you're not seeing HEGs double, in that situation below the discriminatory zone, then you're going to assume it's an abnormal pregnancy. And if the beta HGs are increasing, you could go ahead and treat. You could go ahead and treat that. So when you're above the, above the discriminatory zone, you should be seeing an intrauterine pregnancy. Right? But if you're, and if you do, that's great. If, you're, if you don't, and you don't also don't see um, any ad, ad an axial mass, then you want to repeat that again um, in a couple days to account for inter-rater variability using the ultrasound, make sure that there isn't actually an interuterine pregnancy. And then if, again, you're not seeing, um, you're not seeing an interuterine pregnancy or an adenexal mass, the beta HEGs aren't increasing as they should be, then you, can, then you can just go ahead and treat. All right, so by treat, we're talking about medical therapy. Methotrexate as the general rule in, in you know, stable patients with small ectopic pregnancies, or also surgical therapy in cases of hemodynamic instability, um, failed medical therapy, patients who are very concerned that will be walking around with um, a topic that could rupture, rupture and not be coming in. Um, and then the treatments for that are salpingectomy, remove, just remove the tube, and salping um, gostomy, make a hole in the tube and remove it. And the decision on which one of those to use is very um, sort of above my knowledge base and um, something you'd maybe discuss with the person you're working with, but there's not a super clear um, benefit to one versus the other.